Hey folks, it's Eric. I'm the curator here at Seven Oaks House Museum. Uh, for those of you who haven't had the chance to join us before, uh, you know, for this series we're taking a really special dive into the museum during our off season. It's freezing cold in here, you might even be able to see my breath. It's because we're normally only open in the summers, uh, but it's really exciting to get to bring you in to give this kind of a sneak peek of uh, the museum as people don't normally see it, right? Uh, we opened up this little part for you, but you'll get a behind the scenes view later. Now, this week we're talking about clothing, right? Historic clothing is one of the most personal objects that we can have in a museum. Obviously, it's you know, on your person, right? You wear these things often for hundreds of hours, they have very special meaning to us, or they come from very significant events in our lives, um, and again, have a lot of meaning because of that. But the clothing is also really interesting because it tells us a lot about our society, about broader social history, right? Um, and you know, that's the history that's often written in books, but for me, I find history books never tell the whole story, right? Uh, and especially when it comes to women in history, we never really get the picture. Uh, but these kind of personal histories that you learn through personal objects, family heirlooms, and especially these really, really personal things like our clothing, um, they give us an honest picture of what the past really was like, right? It's not that... Uh, not that diluted or almost uh, controlled narrative about what we're supposed to learn from history, but it's what people actually lived and what people actually did. And for me, that's the coolest story to tell. So these first objects, we're kind of going head to toe in a sense here, I think. Um, sorry, toe to head, actually, I guess. Uh, but we're starting off with shoes. Now, it's sort of a stereotype, right? But who doesn't love a nice pair of shoes? Um, and these are both very, very different, but very, very beautiful pairs of shoes. And they would have existed um, in some ways in different places, but they also connect in a really interesting way. So these white ones over here, uh, these are Regency era dance slippers. So Regency was a time uh, basically in between monarchs in England, but I believe it was around the 1820s. Uh, so these are actually extremely early for our collection, um, and they are among the first shoes that were ever mass produced and actually made in a factory. Prior to this time, you had to get your shoes custom made. This wasn't something for rich people. Anybody had to get shoes handmade uh, to fit them, basically. Or you just got very, very poorly made general kind of like foot bags that you would attach to your feet, right? But these ones are neat. They're so beautiful and delicate. They're made out of this really wonderful white silk. Uh, they're so, so soft. Uh, but they have this impressive double layered construction. They actually have like a soft kind of kid skin leather lining sewed to the inside. Uh, these really delicate, cute little bows here uh, and kind of a funny square toe. It's not a style you'd necessarily see today. They have this uh, leather sole as well. But the really interesting thing, uh, you'll be able to see this in the close up, uh, is that they actually have a size written inside them. Um, so they would have been mass produced in different sizes. This is where the concept of shoe sizes actually really started uh, when it had to be standardized in that way. But even so, completely hand sewn, all done by hand, even the label is actually written by hand with uh, like a dip pen and ink. It's very, very neat. These would have been worn on the feet of one of the richest, most stylish women in London at that time. They were definitely bougie, they were very fancy. Uh, but coming here to Winnipeg at that time, well, it wasn't Winnipeg, this was called the Red River Settlement after our big river, uh, but people had a very different fashion sense, right? So these are what I'm going to call a pair of Métis dance slippers. Very, exactly the same thing as this. These both would have been worn to fancy formal balls. Uh, when you put on your vest, your huge gown with the big hoop skirt, which I will show later, um, and you went out to dance at a wedding or, you know, something like that. These are the things you would have worn just in different places. And for a family like the Inksters, they had Scottish Métis ancestry. They would have worn slippers very much like this. We have beadwork made by the family. And it's a really interesting social story, uh, that social history that I was talking about, because it says so much about the place and the time and the culture. Um, women here would have been wearing these big hoop skirts and these fancy silk gowns. They could have had shoes like this if they wanted, a family like the Inksters, uh, but they didn't. They chose to use this traditional style that would have been passed down from their grandmothers and their mothers. They took traditional moccasin designs and they were inspired by European styles and shoes like this. And so they came up with this really cool kind of hybrid footwear. You know, they're done usually on caribou leather uh, is the preferred type with these beautiful glass trade beads with floral designs. They have a red silk lining 
And they actually have these elastics to attach very much like dance shoes today if you have ballet slippers. So they used local materials, local traditions, and fused them with imported European traditions that many women were familiar with from their husband's side, their father's side, and it created this really unique kind of beautiful thing that you would only find here at this time. Now, one of my favorite things, you can see they actually wore holes in them. Nobody was walking down the street in these. Women, allegedly, you can find diaries from the time where they wrote about the dances that they went to, the parties that they had. And one of the ways, apparently, that you would decide who had the best wedding was how many pairs of moccasins were worn out there. If you could dance holes in your shoes, you knew it was a good time. So that's that kind of secret history, right? You never find this in the story, in the books, uh, but we learn it in a way through these objects that belong to people. So over here, we have something very, very different. Uh, and I'm gonna hold it up so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but this is a cape, basically. On a day like today in the 19th century, this is what we would hopefully be wearing. It's actually made out of bear fur. So black bear fur is basically the warmest, the most, I'm gonna say the most intense kind of fur that you can get. Obviously, it's not easy to go out there and hunt a bear. So there's kind of a certain significance there. But, you know, they live through the winter. This hair is like three inches long. It's incredibly insulated. So on those minus 40 days, when you wonder how people 150 years ago lived, it was stuff like this that got them through it. Uh, so this is actually what we call a coachman's cape. So a uh, coachman is somebody who would have driven basically a carriage, a horse and buggy for a wealthy family, maybe like the Inksters or somebody like the governor here. Um, and they would have been stuck, you know, the family might have had a covered carriage to go in, but the coachman was sitting out there in the elements, the wind, the rain, so he needed something good to stay warm. Uh, and so they would wrap themselves up in bear fur like this. Um, that's how they would try to get through the winter. So I'm going to show you another very interesting piece of winter wear that's along these same lines uh, that some of you actually might even be familiar with still. Now this is another wonderful winter coat, uh, and this actually, a few of you might recognize, this is a coat that was worn by the Winnipeg police uh, from the 19th century all the way up until about the 1960s. This was actually uh, part of their standard issue attire, maybe the 1950s, but a lot of people have told me about seeing these when they were kids. Uh, it's heavy. I won't pick this one up because it weighs about 30 pounds. I couldn't even imagine walking down the street in this. But again, if you were a cop, you're walking a beat, you're standing on the street corner all day long, uh, this is the kind of thing you would need in the deep winter. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, it would have taken you know, most of a bison to make this coat for you. Um, they're issued you know, up until pretty recently. There's kind of an interesting story that people tell, uh, which is that they were so heavy you could never chase a criminal wearing one of these. So when the police saw something happening, they would dramatically throw off their coat onto the ground and then take off chasing after the criminals. It's kind of a cool thing to picture, and people say that if you were caught with one of these police coats, the fine was huge because they dropped them uh, on the ground regularly, and so stealing a cop's coat was a very, very serious offense at the time. Uh, but, you know, often on our really cold days, I kind of wish that I could snuggle up in something like this still. So we're cutting to another room here. This is the master bedroom of the house. This is where uh, John and Mary Inkster would have stayed back in the 1850s. Uh, as I said, we're shut down for the winter, right? So you can see behind the scenes, everything's covered and protected with sheets. But I had to come up here to show you folks this, because this is such a cool, such a unique piece that you often hear about, but very rarely see. So this is what I would call a hoop skirt or a crinoline. And basically this is what really wealthy, stylish women would have worn uh, in the 1860s, 70s especially, um, underneath their dresses. You see those photos of people with the incredibly huge dresses, right? Maybe some of you have seen the meme, there's a joke about Victorian social distancing, right? Because your skirt would be six feet wide so nobody could get too close to you. It's not really a joke, it's real. Um, and this is what wealthy women, like the Inksters, would have worn to uh, fancy dances, balls, parties, very much at the same time that you would have been wearing those beaded moccasins, potentially. And that is such a cool crossover, I think. Very unique sort of cultural thing that wouldn't exist most places in the world. Um, but it's really an interesting thing when you think about it, because 
it's this massive construction. It's all of these metal. Uh, at various points, they actually used whalebone instead of metal because it was the lightest material they had available. Uh, but it's this gigantic metal construction that is sewn together with ribbons and that basically just hangs from your hips. So it flares your skirt out really large. But you can sort of imagine how difficult it would be to wear this. Uh, imagine having this on and trying to dance, uh, trying to actually even just walk down the street, trying to walk through your house without bumping into things. It was not practical. You couldn't do anything wearing this, and that was actually the point, believe it or not. People talk about suffering for fashion, but in the 19th century, uh, women in the Victorian tradition, especially wealthy women, were not really supposed to be functional people, necessarily. You weren't supposed to go to work. You weren't supposed to be doing anything fun like playing sports. You were supposed to be looking pretty, right? Beautiful for your husband, perched on the edge of a chair. And sometimes the fashion was actually designed to really make it difficult to be a person and to do your own things. This is a really, really interesting example of that, I think. Uh, so a unique piece to see. So we're going to break with the clothing theme a little bit here, just because it's such an interesting object, and it does relate to what we've been talking about. So this is what we would call in English a cradleboard. Uh, you know, the real term that's used around here is a tikkanagin. Uh, and this bag on it would sometimes be called a moss bag. But what this is, this is basically uh, the type of baby carrier that was used here in this area by indigenous people. Uh, indigenous women all around North America actually used these, uh, but this is one that would have been used here in Red River. And it's actually very interesting because this Tikkanagin belonged to one of the Inkster women, uh, Mary Inkster, the mother of the family. And it's really, really interesting because in a lot of ways it might be tempting to see them as a wealthy settler family, right? Although they were Métis, they did participate in a lot of this, you know, Victorian settler culture. They wore these fancy dresses, they participated in the trade, um, they were uh, Protestants themselves. But you know, it shows in a lot of ways that just like the moccasins, they didn't let go of these traditions. And it was often the women in the family that preserved these things uh, and that passed them down through the generations privately in the home. Even if a family like the Inksters publicly might have said, you know, we're Scottish, right? Because it was not considered acceptable to be Métis to admit you were indigenous uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, at home, the women preserved these traditions. The Inksters were carried in a Tikkanagan like this when they were babies. And this thing, Actually, you would strap it to your back, basically, so that you could carry your baby with you at all times while you were working, while you were harvesting, while you were gardening, while you were out doing anything else. Uh, because that's what it took to survive here. This was a harsh place. There were no, well, there were very few women who got to sit at home perching on the edge of a chair in their hoop skirt, right? Even a family like the Inksters might have done it for special occasions, but on the day to day, they worked a farm. They still had to work to survive and to eke out a living here. Uh, and so I find that a very interesting contrast, right, between uh, the European ideal of the woman who is, you know, sort of an object, basically, and not really doing much for herself, uh, whereas here you have that very realistic tradition of what it actually takes to survive. And I think that's quite neat. It's all handmade out of wood. Uh, this would have been bent with steam, which is actually really, really cool to make this heart shape. Protects the baby's face. This part is uh, a type of wool cloth lined with red velvet, uh, sorry, red silk, and it's got some kind of uh, hide ties to attach it together. And the reason it's called a moss bag is because you needed a diaper, right? Uh, in a funny way, it's beautiful and it has so much meaning to it. It's very symbolic, but it's one of the grosser objects that we have in the collection. I would not touch it without gloves on, personally. Uh, because these were often passed down from generation to generation. So you might have three generations of baby poop in this. I'm not joking. Uh, it's called a moss bag because you would collect moss and bundle it up in the bottom to act as a diaper to collect the baby's waste. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense when you're out in the bush, right? Uh, but in the context of the museum, this is why we wear gloves, right? Very cool pieces, though, and they highlight... Um, they highlight the hybrid culture here, right? The, the fusion of indigenous and European settler traditions. And families like the Inksters really embody that, I think, in a super unique way. 